Good afternoon and welcome back to Downing Street for the Daily Coronavirus Briefing. I'm joined by Professor Jonathan Van Tam, our Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and by Baroness Dido Harding, the Chair of NHS Improvement and of our Test and Trace Program. Today we formally launch NHS Test and Trace. This is an incredibly important milestone for the country and I know people will want to hear about it. Before I do, I'd just like to update you on the latest coronavirus data. 3,798,490 tests have now been carried out in the UK, including 117,013 tests yesterday. 267,240 people have tested positive, which is an increase of 2,013 cases yesterday. Of those who tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 37,460 people have sadly died. And since yesterday, 412 deaths have been recorded. We mourn them and we will not forget them. As I said yesterday, thanks to your effort and sacrifice, we are past the peak. We flattened the curve, we protected the NHS. And the big question that we're all working to answer is this. Until an effective treatment or vaccine comes through, how can we get back to doing more of the things that make life worth living without risking safety or putting lives at risk? NHS test and trace is a big part, not the only part, but a big part of the answer to that question. NHS test and trace means we can start to replace the national lockdown with individual isolation for those who've been in contact with the virus and local action where it's necessary to respond to a flare-up. The concept is simple. First, through testing, we hunt down the virus, finding out who is infected right now. And I use we very deliberately because we all have our part to play. This is a national effort and we all have a role. If you have symptoms, you must isolate immediately and get yourself a test. Yesterday, 2013 people tested positive and the next step is that through contact tracing, like detectives, the NHS clinician from <coughs> NHS Test and Trace and the person who's tested positive work together to identify the possible movements of the virus, where it's been, and who else it might have infected. Then we isolate those contacts who might have been infected, so the virus is unable to spread and we break the chain of transmission. Think of it like this. The virus exists only to reproduce. That is its sole biological purpose, to make as many copies of itself as possible. If we can thwart that purpose, we can control the virus and ultimately defeat it. We must all follow the NHS test and trace instructions because this is how we control the virus and protect the NHS and save lives. Some people have asked why now? Why not launch this programme earlier in the course of the pandemic? The answer is because we needed to flatten the curve. Right at the start of the epidemic, we had a contact tracing system in place. But as the virus raged towards its peak, the number of infections grew so large that we needed a national lockdown. That was the only way to get it under control. Effectively, everyone in the country was contacted and told to stay at home. Now, we've got the number of new infections each day right down, and the number of contacts of those who've tested positive is small enough that we can be in touch with everyone who we need to. And of course, testing cap capacity is critical to making this work. We now have the capacity for 161,000 tests a day. And because of that increased capacity, I can announce that we're expanding eligibility yet further. From tomorrow, we're expanding eligibility for testing to include the under fives, so that now every single person who has symptoms of coronavirus can get a test, no matter their age. And what's more, 
To make NHS test and trace as effective as possible, it is very important that everyone with symptoms must isolate immediately and go and get a test. Now, I want to thank and pay tribute to everyone who's been involved in making this big project happen. Uh, Dido Harding, who's led the work, the technicians in the labs who've been making mass testing a reality, the contact tracers manning the phones, the healthcare staff providing the expert advice, and the companies who've helped us put it all together at a record scale and pace. And what really matters is this, to protect your friends and your family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. This is being launched today in England. Northern Ireland already has a system in place, and my colleagues in the Scottish and Welsh governments are working to bring in a system as soon as they can. All four nations have been working together to make sure we have systems that are coordinated across the whole country. And the instructions to people are clear. If you get symptoms, isolate immediately and get a test. If you are contacted by NHS Test and Trace, instructing you to isolate, you must. It is your civic duty. So you avoid unknowingly spreading the virus and you help to break the chain of transmission. This will be voluntary at first because we trust everyone to do the right thing. But we can quickly make it mandatory if that's what it takes. Because if we don't collectively make this work, then the only way forward is to keep the lockdown. Put better, the more people follow the instructions, the safer we will be, and the faster we can safely lift the lockdown. So do it for the people you love. Do it for your community. Do it for the NHS. And do it for all those frontline workers who've done so much and gone out every day to put themselves at risk to keep you and your family safe. And in return for following those instructions, you'll have the knowledge that when the call came, you did your bit at a time when it really mattered, when the whole country, who are desperate to see their families, were counting on you to do the right thing. You did your bit to bring us all closer together and closer to the day when we can be reunited. This system will start tomorrow morning at 9am. And the first people who will be contacted will be the people who received a positive result today. This is a very distinct change on our approach. And I just want to take a moment to recap the extent of the change. Before today, we said isolate to anyone with coronavirus symptoms in their households. This remains vital. From 9am tomorrow, in addition, if you are contacted by an NHS test and trace advisor advising you that you must isolate, then you must do that whether you have symptoms or not. Now, I also know that for those without symptoms who receive that call, I fully acknowledge that this is a big ask and that you're going to make a sacrifice but it's for a purpose, and the purpose is the safety of everyone. Because we know that you can have the virus and spread it to other people without ever having symptoms at all. And it's not just the safety of all, but the liberty at all, of all that is at stake here. We're only in a position to be able to reopen primary schools and outdoor markets if they're COVID secure this coming Monday because we've flattened the curve and now we have this system in place. And in the coming weeks, we will gradually and very carefully move away from a lockdown that's national in scope, blanket in application, and start moving towards a system that's much more targeted in scope and focuses local action on tackling local flare-ups. This will help us restore some of the basic freedoms that matter so much to people and doing some of the things that people are yearning to do like seeing friends and family, booking a holiday or getting a haircut, all the while controlling the virus and keeping people safe. It's a brand new service on a scale never seen before. There will be bumps in the road, but we will constantly improve it. And in the weeks ahead, we'll ramp up the service still further. And once the system's bedded in, we'll roll out the NHS contact tracing app that is being piloted in the Isle of Wight. And of course, NHS test and trace is only one part of the answer. 
It's not the whole answer. All the action we're taking to get R down and keep R down, it all requires us to keep doing the right thing. Testing and tracing will help us to hunt down this virus. It's one of the tools with which we can finish the job and we all need to play our part. So please, stay alert, control the virus and save lives. I'm now going to ask Baroness Harding to set out some more of the details of NHS Test and Trace, and then Professor Van Tam to take us through the daily statistics. Thank you, Secretary of State. This is a brand new service which has been launched at scale in a very short space of time. And as the Secretary of State has just said, we all have a part to play, and it will only succeed if each of us does our bit. I want you to feel safe and confident to play an active part in NHS Test and Trace for you, your loved ones, and our country. We do need you to follow the following three steps. Step one, if you have one or more of the symptoms of coronavirus, a fever, a new continuous cough, or a loss of your sense of taste or smell, you must immediately self-isolate. Step two, you should then book a test on the nhs.uk slash coronavirus site, or if you don't have internet access, by dialing 119. Do not leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, you will then be contacted by the NHS Test and Trace Service within 24 hours. All contact tracers have been undergoing training and induction before the beginning of this week and before they start work. Step three. NHS Test and Trace will help you establish who you've been in close contact with and so who you might have infected and will gather their contact details. This could include members of your household or someone you've been within two metres of for more than 15 minutes. You will also be given clinical advice and support for dealing with the disease yourself. NHS Test and Trace in turn will get in touch with those contacts. So if you've been exposed to an infected person, they will be in contact with you. You will then be instructed by the NHS to self-isolate for 14 days, even if you don't have symptoms or you feel perfectly well. You need to follow these instructions. This individual and collective effort is vital if we're to keep the rate of infection down and carefully lift the lockdown. We're working hand in hand with communities and local authorities to make sure that you have the support you need to cope when you are self-isolating. This is why the government announced last week it's giving £300 million to local government to support this on the ground, tailoring support in response to your local needs. Over the past few days and weeks, I've spoken to a huge number of people and I've heard real support and a desire to make this work. We all want to get back to a more normal way of life, and this is an important step on that journey. NHS Test and Trace is one of the most ambitious and complex projects that any of us have ever worked on. It's brought together so many people from all walks of life to work together on this common goal. We already employ over 40,000 people, both directly and through trusted partners, who are working heroically to deliver both testing and contact tracing at scale across the country. So I'd like to offer my heartfelt thanks to Public Health England, all our NHS colleagues, local authorities and their directors of public health and their teams, all our partners in both the public and private sector who have helped create the largest network of diagnostic testing facilities in British history, and to everyone who has signed up to be a contact tracer. And I'd also like to thank you. We will be constantly developing and improving as we go. Together, we can help contain the virus, stop it spreading further, and return to a more normal way of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Baroness Harding. And now, uh, Professor Van Tam will take us through the daily statistics. Thank you, Secretary of State. Good afternoon. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> So the first up update I'm going to give you this afternoon um, is one relating to transport use in Great Britain. And you can see on this slide 
there are six data sets arrayed. The um, top three are for um, small motor vehicles uh, or individual motor vehicles, cars, light good vehicles and heavy goods vehicles. The data are arrayed from the left of the slide, 16th of March to the 25th of May. And what you can see for cars and for light goods vehicles is over that period after the initial lockdown, a gradual increase over time in transport use. For heavy goods vehicles, the trend is the same, but you can see it starts from a much higher baseline, reflecting the fact that many of the HGV journeys were essential even at the point of initial lockdown. If you then turn to the lower part of the slide, you'll see the data for National Rail, for Transport for London, and then for um, buses other than Transport for London, other than London buses. And you can see here essentially very flat curves indeed, um, showing that people have stayed away from public transport, are continuing to stay away from public transport, and preserve this for essential workers. Next slide, please. On testing, this is um, a recap um, following the delivery by the Secretary of State. You can see that um, um, as of 27th of May, um, 117,000 tests were delivered um, in, the, in the previous 24 hours and uh, bringing us to a total of almost 3.8 million. And you can see in terms of the trend at the top of the, the slide, the red graph, you can see that essentially there is now a very high level of testing that continues in the UK. These are tests conducted and tests shipped. And please remember that a very small proportion of individuals may have been tested twice in amongst those data. Then turning to confirmed cases who have um, tested positive, um, you can see that as of the 27th of May, the figure was at 2,013 and a total of 267,000 in total. Rather more importantly, I'd like you to look at the blue trend curve um, which is a seven-day rolling average and continues to show the decline in confirmed cases over time. Next slide, please. Now, this slide shows the data from hospitals. At the top of the slide, it is England only. At the bottom of the slide, it is the four nations, um, each arrayed separately on the traces. So for um, admissions with COVID-19 in England, uh, we are at a figure of 472, um, which is um, considerably down on the 637 reported on the 8th of, 18th of May. And you can see that continuing decline in um, hospital admissions reflected on the upper graph. Then in terms of the percentage of ICU um, ventilator beds occupied by COVID-19 patients, you can see in all four nations on the lower graph a very clear and sustained downward trend and we are now at 11% of total ventilator, ventilatory capacity occupied by COVID-19 patients. Next slide, please. I continue with hospital data. Now I'm showing um, the total number of people in hospital, not new admissions, um, with COVID-19 across the UK. And you can see, you can pick whichever of the um, regional or country specific um, curves you like, but what you can see overall is this continued downward trend in people, total number of people in hospital with COVID-19. Um, we are currently at 8,879, which is down from just over 10,000 at the same time last week. Final slide, please. And finally, I will look at the, um, the uh, COVID-19 deaths confirmed with a positive test. You understand that there are always some deaths which are due to COVID-19 which are not confirmed with a positive test. Um, the latest daily figure is 412. Most, most importantly, again, I'd like you to look at the graph and look at the seven-day rolling average, the yellow curve. And you can see here, there is a continued and sustained downwards curve. Thank you, Secretary Stone. Thanks very much indeed. So we'll now go to questions from the uh, public before taking questions from journalists. And uh, just to remind everybody that these questions from 
the public, just like there's questions from journalists, um, the three of us don't see in advance, and we'll give them uh, give the very best answers that we possibly can. Um, so the first question by video uh, is from Ella from Maidenhead. Ella. Given evidence has shown that those under the age of 45 are at a significantly lower risk of death from COVID-19, can we expect to see the lifting of lockdown restrictions targeted at particular age groups? Well, thank you very much, Ella. Uh, that is a, a great question. Um, and I think I'll, very, I'll give a very high-level response and then ask Professor Van Tam to give uh, the, uh, a more detail and the science. Um, essentially, although those under the age of, 80, of uh, 45 are at significantly lower risk of serious impact of the disease, the evidence show that we are, in fact, just as likely to get it and to transmit it. So although it's, 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 it's safer for us, the impact of those of us under 45 on the spread of the disease uh, is just as great. So the focus, especially of asking those over 70 um, to, uh, to, to take particular care, uh, is because of the risk to them rather than because they are more likely to spread the disease uh, than, than younger people. Um, so, Professor Van Tam, maybe you can give more detail to that answer. Thank you, Secretary of State. Thank you, Ella, for the question. Um, I, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, whilst it is absolutely true that the death rate due to COVID-19 is very, very age-dependent and very steeply rising, um, particularly as we go above the age of 60, um, it is simply not true that all under 45s are not at risk there are some under 45 year olds with very high risk conditions who would be extremely vulnerable and at risk of death if they caught COVID-19. Um, that's the rather minor point. The major points I think have already been made by the Secretary of State that the infection rates are not any lower um, in 45, under 45 year olds. Their propensity to transmit the infection is probably greater than um, those of an older age group, simply based on the number of social contacts and social networking that they have the potential to do in an unrestricted way. And that's very important. The whole game about beating COVID-19 is for now, until we get a vaccine, until we get effective antiviral drugs, is to um, reduce contact between people and particularly reduce contacts between households to a level that is safe and as safe as we can make it consistent with trying to live with this virus. So from that perspective, I would have real concerns about the under 45s being um, picked out for any special measures because of their potential propensity as youngsters um, to have wider social networks and to transmit more to other people. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor Van Tam. Um, uh, Ella, I hope that answers your question. I'm going to add one final point, which you might hear quite a lot from us over the next uh, uh, few days and weeks, which is that for everybody, it will be easier to lift the national lockdown measures the more that people follow the instructions they're given if they're called by NHS Test and Trace, because that is t about targeting people who are at highest risk because we know they've been in contact with somebody who's tested positive. Um, we're now going to go to the next question, uh, which is from Chris from Whitley Bay. And Chris asks, although we recognise that we're far from this pandemic being over, has the government been able to start formulating a strategy for future pandemics so that future generations can be more prepared? And Chris, the answer is emphatically yes. We're learning all we can about this disease and about how to handle this pandemic all the way through. Uh, in fact, earlier this afternoon, the Prime Minister has been talking about some of the lessons from SARS, a previous pandemic that had a very big impact in East Asia, but less so here. And it is incredibly important that we learn as much as we possibly can about uh, the strategy for future pandemics, uh, exactly as you say, so that future generations can be as prepared as possible. 
Uh, thanks, Chris. And we'll now turn to questions from the journalists. The first is from Sophie Hutchinson from the BBC. Hi, Sophie. Hi. Um, you've described this new test and trace program as being on a scale never seen before. But are you sure you have sufficient capacity to test the contacts of all of those infected? You've referred to there being around 2,000 newly infected people in the UK every day. But the Office for National Statistics puts that figure at around 9,000 for England alone. Uh, thank you, Sophie. I'm going to give a very short answer and then ask Dido to give more detail. There's 2,013 people yesterday who tested positive. You're quite right that the Office for National Statistics uh, testing survey estimates that there are around 9,000, uh, between 7 and 9,000, we think, uh, people who actually had coronavirus. We need as many of them as possible to come forward for testing to make sure that they can uh, then have their contacts traced through the NHS test and tracing system. So we, we do need to make sure that everybody who has symptoms comes forward so that we can find as many cases as possible and therefore they can, uh, they can get the benefits of the NHS test and trace system and we can use it with its full capacity to, uh, to, to trace and hunt down the virus. And on the more detail of the question, Dido. So we have 25,000 contact tracers ready to start work tomorrow. Um, that is easily enough to trace down the contacts today when the vast majority of us are in lockdown. So what we've seen in the Isle of Wight, uh, where we've been trialling, um, actually at the moment most of us have very few close contacts because we're, we're in lockdown. So maybe less than five have been genuinely within two metres of us uh, for more than 15 minutes. So if anything, I'm worried tomorrow that many of my brilliant contact tracers are not going to be very busy tomorrow as we start to, to, to encourage more people to get a test. Um, we do expect that we will scale up the service as lockdown measures are gradually released and we'll scale it up both in human and in technology form. So one of the things that uh, when you first um, are contacted, you'll be contacted online and by SMS. Um, and if you can, you'll enter all the details electronically and you'll be contacted by a, a, a person only if you haven't been able to do that. So there's actually really very large capacity today and that'll only get augmented as we roll out the app. Can I come back to you very briefly? Uh, go ahead. Um, I mean, you've mentioned that testing is critical for this tracing uh, service to work, and of, of course it is. Have you therefore ironed out the problems we've been hearing of doctors who still can't get tests or people waiting for tests for up to a week? Will, will that have all been sorted out by tomorrow? Well, yesterday, the turnaround time of our tests, uh, we returned 84% of all tests in our drive-in centres within 24 hours and 95% of all tests within 48 hours. Um, I still don't think that's good enough. It's got to get better and better and there will be examples where the turnaround time hasn't been fast enough. Uh, and we, as you rightly say, an important part of this service is the speed with which we go as individuals from recognising that we've got the symptoms to the point at which the people we've been in close contact with are isolated. So all of us have got a role to play in speeding that up. Um, actually, there's been tremendous progress in the last few weeks in those turnaround times for testing, and I think we are in good shape to start tomorrow. But we will continue improving and learning as we get going. Um, this is a very large service that has its first um, full day of operation tomorrow. So there will be some kinks, for sure. Um, but we're committed to listening and learning to the user and citizen feedback to keep improving. I hope that uh, answers your question, Sophie. Thank you. We'll turn to Robert Peston from ITV. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yesterday, Secretary of State, you raised the prospect of us moving from a, the national lockdown that we're living through now, and which is being eased, into the potential for local lockdowns if there are local flare-ups. Who will identify whether a tower block or a couple of roads have to be locked down? And how will that be communicated? Who will enforce it? Well, I'll ask uh, Dido again to take us through the detail of this. Of course, making sure we make the local judgments where the directors of public health have got a critical role to play. Um, and 
we tie that up with the national level intelligence that we have, for instance, from uh, the testing program, through the new joint biosecurity center and through Public Health England, this is a critical task. It's something Public Health England have long experience in doing for all sorts of, uh, of infectious disease outbreaks that happen um, in, in normal times. Uh, and it's all part of the overall NHS test and trace system uh, that Baroness Harding is putting together. So, so what we're building is a, a, a genuine national effort. It's both national in scale in terms of the 25,000 uh, contact tracers working in their homes across the country, but actually the, the way we will stamp out uh, spread of infection is going to be local action. So that's why uh, the government granted £300 million last week to local authorities. It's higher tier local authorities that have the statutory responsibility for public health, who employ the experts, who will be the people who arrive when you start to see um, a rise in infection in a community, in a school or in a hospital or in some part of, of your town, um, who will help us work through what to do. Um, I, it needs to be locally led and nationally supported, supported with data and supported with scale so that you can get an early warning that trouble might be, might be brewing. Thanks very much. Does that answer your question, Robert? Uh, I think that answers the question. Can, can I just also just follow up with this whole question of where you isolate? And this is not just the uncertainty which some people think has been introduced by what Dominic Cummings did, but just in general, I, you know, let's just say I, I haven't got symptoms, but I get a call that says I've been uh, in contact with somebody who does, has tested positive. Um, do I have to isolate at my normal home? Am I allowed to isolate somewhere else so that others in my household can get on with their lives? What is the rule there? So a really important uh, point to make is that if you are a contact of somebody who's tested positive, so not somebody who's tested positive yourself, but you've been contacted by the NHS Test and Trace uh, program, and you are instructed to isolate, your household members do not have to isolate. They can carry on under the normal guidelines. And that means that uh, you can go home and do your isolation there. Thanks very much. The next question is from uh, Charlotte uh, from Talk Radio. Charlotte. Thank you. Um, this morning, the Community Secretary talked about the idea that the law allows for people to use their good judgment when interpreting how the coronavirus guidelines affect them. I was wondering if you could give us a bit of a sense of what this means on a practical basis. So, for example, if one of our listeners gets stopped by the police and the li listener believes they are using their good judgment, but the police officer disagrees, whose judgment trumps the other ones? Uh, well, thank you, Charlotte. The, there are exceptional circumstances that are uh, written into the, uh, the guidelines, and we set out some of the details of these uh, in advance, and some of the examples are there uh, in the guidelines and the police themselves have set out uh, a, a huge degree of detail uh, to make sure that these, uh, these rules can properly be enforced and policed. Uh, from the point of view of the new NHS test and trace program that we're launching today, in the first instance, this will be voluntary. Uh, we think that there is a very, very strong uh, instinct on, from the British people to follow these, to, so that when the NHS phones you up, or contacts you and says, you must isolate, uh, then our, we are, we're confident that people will. Now, of course, we could also mandate that, uh, but in the first instance, uh, we're not going to. We want people to feel safe, to, to tell NHS Test and Trace as soon as they have symptoms, to feel confident and safe in telling NHS Test and Trace who they've been with so that we can isolate people who might be infectious as fast as possible. And I have great faith in the British public that we all want to be able to get our lives back to normal and that we are committed to doing that together. Thanks very much. Uh, Professor Van Tam also. Yes, I, I'll just come back in here and remind people that um, with this virus, the natural R is around about three. That means left unchecked, one case infects three more. So 
it's going to grow out of control very quickly. The extent to which we can keep control of it um, very much depends upon the extent to which people across our entire population engage with and cooperate with NHS test and trace. And put simply, the more we do so, the greater room for manoeuvre the government will have in terms of making life as normal as possible whilst still keeping this virus under control. Thanks very much. I hope that answered the question, Charlotte. Can I quickly come back? Can I just check? Obviously, it, it is clear that there are some grey areas here. When there are grey areas, whose authority is it that decides whether something is in keeping with the law? Uh, well, in those areas where we have made uh, regulations that are mandatory, there is a normal system and process in which the police police those, uh, and then the court system is there ultimately to make decisions. However, in NHS Test and Trace, we're not bringing in a mandatory system, at least in the first instance, uh, because we have the faith in the British people that they will follow uh, what is needed, because it is the right thing to do uh, for themselves, it's the right thing to do for their loved ones and their families, and it's the right thing to do for people's whole communities, because it will make it less likely that wider action will be needed locally, and because it'll make it less likely that there's a local flare-up. So the, uh, the civic duty and the personal responsibility to follow the instructions of NHS Test and Trace is a very important part of what we're asking people to do following the launch of this service from 9 o'clock tomorrow morning when the first people will start to get contact from NHS Test and Trace and ask to do something that we recognise is a big ask, which is to, uh, to isolate, self-isolate for two weeks. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Um, next question is Hugo Guy from the I. Thank you, Secretary of State. Is the reason that the tracing app uh, has been delayed from its original launch date because of problems with the trial on the Isle of Wight? And are you confident, uh, both you and um, Baroness Harding, are you confident that the test and trace scheme will continue to work even if the app never works uh, as originally intended? Well, the answer to the first question is um, no, it's not technical problems, it's that one of the things we learnt about in the Isle of Wight is that uh, rolling out the system where people are asked to isolate even if they have no symptoms um, starts better when it comes in uh, in human form from the, uh, from the contact tracers and the, uh, the app is working in the Isle of Wight uh, and when we have uh, successfully embedded this new principle that I talked about today that uh, Baroness Harding set out in great detail, this new principle, which is if you are called, uh, contacted by the NHS Test and Trace Programme, even if you have no symptoms, then you need to isolate uh, for up to 14 days. Once that principle is embedded, then that's the time to bring the app to bear because the app is a complement to this system. Uh, even without it, this system would be... Uh, successful, uh, but it's a complement because there are some contacts that it's that you don't know that you might have made. For instance, if you're sitting uh, near somebody on a bus um, within two meters of them, you wouldn't know the how to get in contact with that person. Uh, but through the app system, we will be able to identify those contacts. So the app is a complement. It is best brought forward uh, once this system uh, is embedded. And that's what we plan to do. It's not because of any technical glitches. Thanks very much. Uh, Nadine White from the Huffington Post. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Um, new data has revealed that black, Asian and minority ethnic people in England are 54% more likely to be fined under coronavirus rules than white people. If Dominic Cummings were black, it is statistically more likely he would have been stopped by police while out with his family. What is your message to Britain's black communities who worry that fines are not being issued fairly? And I also have a question for Professor Van Tam. Uh, we know that Public Health England review into disproportionate BAME deaths from COVID-19 is due by the end of this month. Uh, are you able to share any preliminary findings at this time? This is obviously a really pressing issue. Thanks, Nadine. This is an incredibly important issue. Uh, and, of course, it's vital 
that the, uh, the rules where there is mandation are policed uh, without fear or favour and fairly and equally uh, according to the evidence. And I'll ask uh, Professor Van Tam to respond on the point about the research. Yes, so thank you for the question. Um, clearly, I'm from a, an ethnic minority. Um, I regard this as very pressing and very important. I have heard from Public Health England that the report is on schedule per timelines. Um, I believe that the report is going to be very comprehensive when it comes out. It is also going to deal inevitably with enormous complexity, something that I've talked about before now. How you unpick age, gender, underlying comorbidities, crowding, deprivation, all of these things, how you unpick them from the black and minority ethnic signal that is also in the data. And so I'm not going to kind of trail this and um, give you lots of, of new findings at this point because I think that's for Public Health England to do in their own time. But I will say, again, it's pressing. I believe it to be on schedule. It's going to be comprehensive and it is going to involve quite a bit of complexity and care with how we interpret it and what we take forwards and how. Thanks very much, Nadine. Final question is from Dan Martin of Leicestershire Live. Thank you, Ms. Hancock. You mentioned earlier that schools are due to start going back on Monday, but we know here in uh, Leicester and Leicestershire that two thirds of parents are unhappy about sending their kids back to the timetable the government has pinned to this. Um, despite the best efforts of councils and head teachers here, um, there's still clearly a, an issue of public confidence about a safe return. So, what more could and should the government be doing? to help parents make what is a very difficult and very imminent decision? Well, I think this is a really important question, Dan. And um, it, right across Leicestershire, I would say to parents of children uh, who are in uh, reception year, year one or year six, which are the three years of primary school that are um, coming back on Monday, I would say um, that we wouldn't have made this decision unless it was safe. And we've considered all of the factors. Um, there is a, a very, very, very low uh, impact of the disease on uh, children. Um, and there's, a, uh, there's clear measures been put in place by the Department for Education and by schools uh, to make sure that the uh, schools are safe for children. Um, so I would urge parents to take that very seriously. Of course, many schools have been open throughout with the children of key workers in them as well. And I'm very grateful to, the, uh, to all the schools who've stayed open, for instance, so the NHS staff and staff in social care have been able to send their children to school. And there's one further thing that can give people that confidence. And I'll ask Baroness Harding to come in on this. And that is that with the NHS test and trace program in place, it means that we'll be able to be more targeted in finding those positive cases, in making sure that we find out all of the contacts that they may have uh, infected and passed the disease onto, and therefore use this more targeted approach to be able to control the virus. So, um, as the Secretary of State said earlier, we're extending the eligibility for tests to the under fives. That's really important for, for our early years children and schools. And the way NHS Test and Trace will work is that it will provide an early warning system for local communities to spot that there are maybe a growing number of cases in a school and immediate action can be taken. So it's not just that we will be contacting and identifying and isolating everyone very quickly, we'll also be able to spot if an outbreak is starting. So I think parents um, across the country can feel really confident that we've got a system that's got their back. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, thanks very much for your question. Great to have you here in Downing Street. Uh, that concludes our daily coronavirus briefing. See you again soon.